Okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. We'll let Ryan um, start the broadcast if you want to. You should have the button up there somewhere. Yeah, I do. I can certainly do that. Um, you guys will have to do the recording. I obviously can't do that. Yeah, Steve's well, going to... can, but... Steve's going to handle the recording. Yep, okay. started it. And then what we'll do is I'll go ahead and uh, I'll get things started. I'll give you a little intro and, and all that good stuff, and then uh, we'll just kind of go from there. It should only take me two minutes <laughs> before I turn it over to you. It won't be long. Oh, that's fine. No big deal. All right, here we go then. All right. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, I think uh, we're about ready to get started here in another, in about a minute or two. Um, Do you have a slide deck you showed? Do you need me to change the presentation? No, I didn't. We didn't make one up. Uh, we used to do that, but it, um, it's one of those things going back and forth and this and that. It's almost easier just to, just to let you get set up and then um, go from there. So at this point, I guess everyone should be able to hear me. Um, and then, Ryan, you're, uh, at this point, you're also not, not sharing your screen. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, I just want to, I just want to make sure it was it was correct. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. According to my my watch, it's 11 o'clock. Hey, everybody! I'd like to welcome you to the uh, DBA Fundamentals vir Virtual Chapter. Uh, this will be our first meeting um, in March. Uh, today's presentation is entitled "Manage Your Shop with CMS and Policy Based Management." It will be presented by Ryan J. Adams. And I'll be turning things over to Ryan here in a minute, but I need to do a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, first and foremost, if you have any questions, you'll see an area um, in your GoToWebinar uh, menu uh, where you can type your questions in. We'll be taking questions uh, throughout the presentation when we have time. Um, you should also see, I think to the on the left-hand side, uh, you should see a little hand, and if you have problems, you can you can raise your hand, or you can ping me. My name is Mark Swafford. Uh, you can ping me directly, and I'll see if if you have any kind of audio problems uh, or things of that nature. You're welcome to ping me, and we can see if we can help you take care of that. Uh, today's session will be recorded, and in about a week or so, we'll have that in the archive section of the DBA Fundamentals. Uh, .sql pass website. Uh, so check that out in about a week. Um, if you did notice earlier, I said this will be our first meeting of March. Typically we have one meeting, one virtual meeting per month, uh, but we've been asked by PASS this month to uh, host an additional meeting, um, and it will be in the SQL Server 2014 webinar series. It'll be this Thursday, March 6th at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. And Microsoft will be presenting SQL Server 2014 in memory OLTP, and they'll give us an overview of that. So that'll be pretty cool. You guys, um, hopefully, you can make it. Uh, you can go to our website and register on the uh, top left of our front page. Uh, I would like to thank the Professional Association of SQL Server for supporting us, uh, the DBA Fund Fundamentals Virtual Chapter, uh, the management at PASS. They really work hard um, behind the scenes uh, to bring us free training you know, all over the world, and they, they really do a good job. Um, again, my name is Mark Swafford. I'm the chapter president of the DBA Fundamentals Virtual Chapter. You can send myself or any of the uh, DBA Fundamentals management team any questions, comments that you have, and our contact information is on our website. Uh, today, the meeting will be moderated uh, by myself, Mark Swafford, and Steve Cantrell, who is at SQL Select on Twitter, and uh, you, you can check him out. Uh, but today, um, the fo our focal point is our meeting, and we're going to get right to that. So, uh, Ryan, if you can hear me, I think that's all the, the housekeeping uh, that we have, at least at the moment, um, and we're ready for you to take it away whenever you're ready, buddy. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. All right, folks. So, um, 
today we're going to talk about uh, two things, central management server and policy-based management. So a little bit about myself, you can see there on the slide, I do blog on ryanjadams.com. I'm on Twitter, uh, go out there and follow me anytime I put new blog posts out or, or talk about different things, I put it out there on Twitter. Um, I, uh, I work for Verizon, I've worked there for a little over 15 years now. So I've done a lot of different things in that amount of time. Um, the group that I work in does identity management stuff. Obviously, on the DBA, so I handle all the SQL Server stuff on the back end of that. Some of it's custom applications, and some of it, uh, you know, it's just some in-house stuff, and then some of it is vendor applications. I'm also pretty involved in the SQL Server community. I live in Dallas, Texas. I'm on the board of directors for the North Texas SQL Server User Group. I help run the group here. I'm also um, the president of the Performance Virtual Chapter. So if you guys want to check out any of the other virtual chapters, Performance One's a good one to check out. And um, I'm also a regional mentor for PASS. So I help the user group leaders for the South Central region, uh, make sure that they have all the tools and things that they need in order to run their user groups. So jumping into things here, here's what we're going to take a look at today. We're going to start off and look at uh, Central Management Server first. We're going to look at how, that, how do I find it, those kinds of things. And then we're going to look at importing and exporting. Some of you may use registered servers now in Management Studio. And if you do, you're definitely going to want to know about the importing and exporting so that you don't have to recreate these things if you decide to use a CMS. From there, we'll go in and we'll look at policy-based management. We'll take a look at how to create them. After we create them, how do we evaluate them against the servers in our environment to see whether they violated a policy or not? We're going to take a look at alerts. I don't want to have to go in and run and evaluate all these policies manually all the time. I would prefer that they run by themselves and I can automate it. And then if something does violate a policy, then I want to be notified of that. And so we'll look at how we can set up some alerts for that. And the last thing, we won't get real deep into it, is reporting. I just want to show you one of the open source projects out there that can kind of get you some nice uh, pretty reports uh, that you can take a look at all the evaluations in your environment. So central management server, if you haven't used central management server today, what this is, is like I said, it's just like registered servers. So you go to management studio and I can register connections to multiple SQL servers. Well, that's all fine and great, but if I have a decently large shop and let's say I have 10 guys in my, uh, in my uh, DBA group and I decommission a server, well, I'm storing all these registrations locally in Management Studio on my machine, which means that every one of those 10 guys is going to have to go out and remove that from their connections. If I bring and provision a new server for a new project, then they have to add that. So what this does is it gives me a central location to keep all that information in. Of course, there's some requirements as there are with most things. This was new in SQL Server 2008, which means that you have to have a SQL Server 2008 or above instance to host this on. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't connect to other instances. So if I have SQL 2000 and SQL Server 2005 instances, I can register connections to those. I just can't create the central management server on one of them. It has to be on a 2008 or above box. Now the other cool thing is you'll notice that Express Edition is supported. So if I wanted to dedicate this to a particular server, and have it, that's all it does is be my CMS, then I can do that and not have any additional licensing costs because I can run it in Express Edition. Of course, you're creating another server for that. I can tell you that the overhead for CMS is very, very minimal. I don't think I've ever seen anybody actually do that, but it is an available option. Most people just use a server that's already available in their environment. Uh, everything for CMS is stored in MSDB. So there's two roles that Microsoft created for us in there in the MSDB. One's called Server Group Administrator role there in red. That is the God role. That means that you can do anything. You can add connections to your central management server. You can remove them. It means that I can edit and change them. It means I can even turn it off and completely remove the central management server altogether. The Server Group Reader role is probably who you want your junior DBAs to be. You don't really want them to the administrator role to be able to, to, to kind of muck around with things. You just want them to be able to utilize those connections. So anybody that just simply wants to use the connections, we can put them in that reader role and they'll be able to utilize those as they need. Now, why would I want to use a central management server? What, what are the advantages? 
And the first one is that centralized repository. Because now when we have a decommission of a server or a new provision, we can make that change one time on that single server. And all of your DBAs are connecting to that repository. So they're not keeping all these registrations locally in SSMS anymore. Now they're connecting to a server and utilizing the connections off of that. And the really cool thing about doing that is now I only have to make that change in one place. I don't have to rely on everybody to add and remove and edit their connections. It just makes it a much cleaner environment and much easier to manage that way. We can run queries against multiple servers simultaneously. And it is simultaneously. It doesn't do them one at a time. If you are going to run a query against 10 servers, and when we get into the demo, I'll show you how to do this. But it's pretty cool to be able to run queries against more than one server at a time. We can group our servers logically. Um, one of the things that I have done in my past um, for my company is I actually designed and architected all of their Active Directory. And if you're familiar with Active Directory and OUs and how to organize things and those types, it's very, very similar here. And what I can tell you is that you always want to create your groups and design things logically by how your company works. If you have a DBA team that, uh, that is a centralized database team and maybe you split that team up between the east the West and the central region of the United States, then it might make sense for you to create folders called East, West, and Central. But if your company doesn't work that way, if maybe you have a particular team that's dedicated to a certain application, then it's probably going to make more sense for you to create a folder for each application. Now, of course, you can create folders under folders so you can get more granular as you go down, but you will thank yourself and it will be easier to manage these things and they're fairly easy to move around after you get them done. Um, but we can, um, if you if you group them by how your company works, you'll thank yourself in the long run. I promise you. The other thing, and we'll talk about this when we get into the policy-based management section, is this is where the two work together. Central management server really gives PBM some power, and the two work together really, really well. It allows me to take what PBM was designed for, and extend the reach of, of checking those uh, policies a little bit better. So we'll take a look at how we can do that. Of course, everything has an advantage, has a disadvantage too. Now, the good news with the CMS is the disadvantages really aren't that bad. The first one is that the CMS server itself can't be part of its own group. So that means if I have server one, and that's my central management server, but that server also happens to house databases that are part of application five. And I've created a folder in the CMS called App5, and I want to add a connection to uh, Server 1 there. Well, because Server 1 is also the CMS, I can't add a connection to it, to itself, essentially, is what this is saying. Now, you'll notice I have a workaround there. And the workaround is, is to use a local loopback IP address. And the real answer here is that I can, I can add a connection to the CMS as long as I don't use the NetBIOS name. So if you go to your server and you run select add at server name, whatever that returns, you can't use that. And that is quite literally, if you dig into it and look at it, that is how the CMS is actually going to figure out whether you are allowed to do this or not. However, if I can resolve that server name by any other means, it's okay with that. Which means a local loop pack IP address works, a fully qualified domain name will work, um, there's a million other ways that we could trick this with, you know, with DNS, WINS, uh, we could even use, I didn't tell you to do this, do not do this, but you could actually use uh, your local host file and trick things out that way. Um, so as long as we can resolve that name by anything other than what its NetBIOS name is, then we can go ahead and add a connection to it. When we use a registered server, we can only use Windows authentication. Now, normally, if we were talking, if I was talking to you in person, I would ask you, why is that a disadvantage? Why do I care that I add servers to the CMS, but I can't use anything other than Windows auth? And so if I can't use SQL authentication. And the disadvantage is, is if I have servers that are in a different domain that's an untrusted domain, maybe they're sitting out in a DMZ or something like that, or maybe it's a standalone server then you're not going to be able to add them to your central management server. 
So importing and exporting. And the reason I want to talk about this is because if you're using registered servers today, then you don't want to have to recreate all of those all over again. It'd be a lot easier if I was able to import those uh, or export them from registered servers and then import them into my central management server instead of having to recreate it all over again. Okay. When we do an export, it's stored in XML format. When we export these local connections, we can have, because registered servers allows us to do Windows authenticated connections and SQL authentication, authenticated connections. And when I show this to you, there's a reason why I want to point this out and, and I want you to see exactly what this looks like. But when you export these connections, I really wanted to know what does it look like? What actually gets exported? Because for me in my environment, it can be a big deal if I have a username that is in sitting there in clear text in an XML file, a password that's sitting there, what exactly is in that file? And I'm going to show you what's in that file. So let's jump into a demo and take a look here. Now on my machine here, I actually have two instances of SQL Server running. Uh, the first one's called Demo1. And demo one is just a, uh, a regular default instance. And then I have a second instance running that's a named instance. Uh, that instance is demo one slash inst01. Okay. So the first thing I want to show you is where do we find the CMS at? Normally, when you open up Management Studio, you kind of see exactly what you have here, and you kind of see the Object Explorer. Now, of course, if you're familiar with registered servers, you already know where this is. Um, by default, it's not actually shown. So if we go up here to the top under View, and what we're looking for here is registered servers. So you can see that's like the fourth one down, that's registered servers. So we'll click on Registered Servers. It opens up a new tab here on the left. And you can see that I actually have three registrations here for my local registered servers. Okay, so demo one, if we open this and look at it, that was before. If we look at the properties of this guy, we can see that the server name is demo one. We're using Windows authentication. That looks fine and good. That's nice and easy. Okay, that's my local default instance. This guy is the same. The only difference here is that I'm using uh, SQL Server authentication as opposed to Windows authentication. And then the last one here is that named instance I told you about. And it's also just running Windows authentication. So we've got three connections here. Two of them are technically to the same server. Uh, the default instance, one of them is using Windows Auth, one's using SQL Auth. Okay. We'll take a look at that when we get to the import export part. So here's the first thing. It's, you'll notice that underneath our local server groups, that's my local stuff. Here's central management server. So demo one, the local default instance, is going to be our CMS. So we'll right click and we'll do register central management server. Okay. For our server name, we're just going to do demo one. We're going to use Windows authentication. Now you'll notice here that the drop-down box, we can pick whichever one we want. We have Windows Auth and SQL Server Auth, and both of those are available to me. And that's just because I'm connecting to the CMS. So this isn't a connection. This isn't a registered connection I'm creating in the CMS. So I can use whichever method I want here. But when we add connections, we'll see that we can't do that anymore. So we'll go ahead and we'll just use Windows Auth, make it easy, and we'll click Save. Simple as that, our central management server is here and ready to go. The first thing we usually want to do is we want to create uh, groups. So if I do this, you'll see this one called new server group here. Okay. So I'll do that. And let's say we have one for production servers. We'll do test and then we'll do development. 
So you can kind of see how we can separate these things out. And I can get more specific than that. I mean, I can go into production. I can say, you know what, I put all my production boxes in here. However, let's make sure that um, my 2005 servers are in this folder, and I'm going to put 2012 in here. All right, so we can get as granular as we need to get to make these things look the way we want them and work for our particular environment. So I'm just going to create these guys under prod, and we're going to do a new server registration. And what we're going to do is we'll add the named instance that I have first. It says demo1 insta1 here. Now you'll notice that authentication box, it's grayed out, so we can't change it. Okay, so Windows Auth is required for these connection objects. We cannot use SQL authentication here when we utilize those. All right, so we'll click Save. It'll create that. I can go ahead and um, we can create one for Demo1, the local default instance. Hmm. So we get this error here. And the part I want you to look at and focus on is this very last sentence right here. You cannot add a shared registered server with the same name as a configuration server. So remember, Demo1 is my CMS server, and I'm trying to add a connection to Demo1 onto Demo1. So it's telling me you can't do that. You can't add a connection to your CMS on your CMS. Okay. But remember, I told you there's a workaround to that. Here's how we can get around it. New server registration. I'm going to use the local loopback IP address. Again, we can use a fully qualified domain name here. We can use wins. We can use any other method that will resolve this name. will work just fine. Click Save. Bingo. There it is. Not a problem. Now, the negative using a local loopback IP address here is if I have a bunch of them, that doesn't look very pretty, does it? That's cool because I can fix that. Down here at the bottom, this is the registered server name. I can just type in Demo1 right here. And now it looks nice. Okay. So we've got some ways that we can kind of work around these things. All right, now what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and actually delete these two guys here. Or actually, you know what, before I do that, let me do this. Let's take a look at um, a multi-server query. Now, wherever I right-click at, this is going to take effect from that folder down. So if I had, I'm going to right-click on prod, but if I had five servers, under 2005 and 5 under 2012, it's going to include all 10 of those plus the demo one and insta one that I have in the prod folder itself. So I'd actually have 12 connections. So I'll right click on prod. What I can do is new query. Now when I open up this new query, what I want to look at is at the very bottom. The first thing I'm going to notice is the color here is this kind of red or salmon type color. Normally it's yellow if I'm just connecting to one box. So seeing this color change is the first indication that, hey, make sure you're aware that you're connected to more than one server and anything you do is going to hit every single box that you're connected to. And it tells me that I'm connected to two out of two. Now the reason it says two out of two is because had there been maybe 12 under there, and let's say that five of those servers had been down, I'll say, okay, well now you're connected to seven out of 10 or seven out of 12 because the other five are down. Okay, so it is possible that if a connection fails, you might not be connected. So make sure you're paying attention to that number that you're connected to what you expected to be connected to. And we'll just do a simple query here. We'll just do a select add app version, take a look and see what that comes back with. Let me expand this column a little bit. So when we zoom in and look at this, what we'll notice is that there's this column server name. Now, normally when I do a select that at version, I only see the second column. I don't ever see that server name column. So that's the first thing a CMS, when we do a multi-server query, is going to do for us. Is it's going to add the server column so that we know, hey, this server returned this result and which, which result belongs to which server. Now, as we can see here, both of these servers are identical. They're both running SQL Server 2012 64-bit edition, uh, Enterprise Edition 64-bit. But that's kind of cool. But that can be dangerous too, right? Because what if I were to connect to dev and prod at the same time, and I thought I was dropping a table in dev, 
and forgot that I was connected to both. Uh-oh. Not good. Get the resume ready. So make sure that you're paying attention to the color and what you're connected to down here at the bottom. There is definite, as, as cool as it can be for your manager to go, hey, they released this new service pack two months ago, and I need to make sure that everything's up to the service pack level. Well, that's great. I don't have to go out and connect to every single server. I can right-click and do it right here in a matter of seconds. I can tell you exactly what I'm running on every single box. Or I can query back permissions or who's in a particular role or, or whatever I need to do and get that information back without having to use MS4, HDB, or... Uh, you know, I mean, we can do it other methods with PowerShell and things like that, but we can do it much easier here, just straight through, through T-SQL. Well, that's fantastic. That's really great that I can do that. But there is a danger factor that I want you to be aware of, that if you're altering things, dropping things, changing things, make sure you're aware of exactly what you're connected to. All right. I'm going to delete these two connections, because what I want to show you here real quick is how to import and export out of these guys. And we'll try and get through this kind of quick here so we can get into policy-based management. The last thing I'm going to show you. So I've got these three connections that are created here. And I don't want to recreate those for my CMS. I'd rather just export them out of here. So what I can do is if I right-click, we'll go under uh, Tasks and Export. Now my default is going to export it wherever I right-clicked at. I could change that selection in here if I haven't, because I could have folders in here too as well. Um, I don't, but I could. I'll click the ellipsis here and tell it I want to save it in this file, which already exists. Now, this checkbox down here. This checkbox here says, do not include usernames and passwords in the export file. Hmm. What if I uncheck that box? I wonder what it's going to leave in that plain text XML file if I uncheck it. Because to me, that's a worst case scenario. I want to see if somebody else were able to go in and export and import what they could possibly leave lying out there. So worst case is somebody would uncheck this. Let's see what happens. So I'll click OK. It tells me it already exists, so I'm going to overwrite it. Export was successful. Fantastic. So now we'll go in here and let's actually open this file and take a look. Of course, it's XML. We all love XML. It's the most beautiful thing we've ever seen. Fortunately for you, I've looked at this file more than once. So let's try and see if I can zoom in on the important pieces. Okay, what we're going to look at first here is this connection object. This is demo one, and this was a SQL authenticated account. So remember that we had two instances of SQL Server. Demo one, local default instance, demo one, insta one. This is my name instance, and both of those were Windows authentication. Okay, But we had a third one that was also connected to the default instance here, and it was using SQL authentication. So when we look at this, and we can see... You know, hey, we've got the local loopback IP address. Remember, we renamed it, but the actual connection was using a local loopback IP. Okay, so we can see that that's been exposed. So maybe exposing server names for you is not a problem. Some of you, it may be. We'll also go down here and we'll look at. Uh, let's take a look at this. Right here. <laughs> Help if I didn't write all over it, huh? Let me scroll over a little bit. Okay. So let's take a look at this. Not that I'm going to highlight the whole thing. So I can see that my user ID is sitting here for a SQL authenticated account. So that's exposed. But I can also see that my password uh, is sitting here. But it's not in plain text. It's been hashed. Now the cool thing is, um, for most people, the user ID might not matter. Um, I've worked with some people that work uh, in government, and for them, that's a problem. Uh, if they work for certain government, um, I actually met a gentleman uh, on SQL Cruise when I taught there last year, and he worked for uh, one of the government agencies, and this would not be acceptable for them. They can't have that exposed. So maybe that matters to you, maybe it doesn't. But at least we know the password's not here, okay? So at least we know that that is actually uh, in a hashed value. 
Now if we go down here, and I won't show you both of the other ones, I'll just show you one. So the first one that comes up is demo insta one, so that's our named instance. Let's see what that guy looks like. So that one is right here. And what we see here is the server name's exposed, there's no username, and there's no password because we're using the trusted connection equals true, we're just using Windows authentication. So our domain controllers and stuff handle all of that for us. We don't have to worry about anything being exposed, username or password. So there is definitely one plus there for maybe some folks. So let's go ahead and import this guy. So I'm going to right click on this prod folder we created and try and put them right back where I had them. So I'm going to right click and we'll do import policies. What did I click? I clicked the wrong thing. Tasks, import. I'm just going to point it to the exact same file that we exported to earlier. And then um, it, it, by default, again, wherever I right click at is going to be where it's going to import them to. I could change that and you know click on the dev folder here, or test or whatever, but we'll go ahead and leave it prod for now. And that's where it's going to put them. I'll click OK. Ah, another error. However, this error, we've seen this guy before, haven't we? Can't error to share a registered server. Why? Because one of my registrations that I had in my local uh, registered servers was for demo one, which is my local default instance, which is also my CMS. So again, we're bumping up against the same issue that, hey, we can't add a connection for that. How do I fix that in this particular instance? Well, easiest thing to do is go delete it out of your local registered one, which would be this guy here. I can just right click and delete this guy, and then I can re-export everything and import it all over again. That would be the easiest thing to do. Now you'll also notice here that it did still bring in demo one SQL auth and demo one insta one. So it still brought the other two in. Now what I can tell you here is when you export, we looked at the export XML file and we saw the order that those were in, that is random. It does not export them the way you see them in Management Studio from top down. Um, in fact, the very top account we looked at was a SQL authenticated account, and if you look up there at the top under my local registered servers, that's actually the second one, not the first. And this can be different and change every time you export them, but it also doesn't matter because when you import them, that's also random. So they could be imported in any different, any different method. What I can tell you is, is that if that demo one had run first, it stops wherever we hit that error at. So if that default instance, that demo one, had that on the import been the first one, then we would not have seen anything come in. These two guys here would not have been imported had that been the very first error. Or if it had been the second one, maybe the SQL off one would have come in, then we would have erred and we would have never seen that demo one insta one. So be aware of that. The other thing you might be thinking is, hey, you just imported a SQL authenticated account into registered servers. How did you do that? You told me you couldn't do that. Well, it imported it, but let's go look at what it, what it really is. It changed it to Windows authentication. So you'll notice that it's grayed out here, but it changed it to Windows auth. And you know that it used to be a SQL auth because guess what? That was the account that was in there when we used SQL auth. It just grays the whole thing out, and it uses Windows. So if you have SQL authenticated connections in there, it's going to automatically convert those. All right, let's switch back to the slide deck here, and let's talk about policy-based management. Let's get into that. Okay, policy-based management is really cool because, and especially if you work in a large environment, it now gives us a way to ensure standards across our enterprise. So a policy is nothing more than a group of rules and configuration settings and how we want servers to look a certain way. And what we can do with that is say, look, I want all of my Exchange servers to look like this, and I want all of my SQL servers to look like this. And every SQL server that supports this app needs to have these settings, but all ones that support this app need to have different settings. We can enforce that. That way, six months later, 
somebody didn't change a setting, we can guarantee that well, the way we set it up is the way it's going to look in six months. That way we have these standards and we can force those across our enterprise, which is a really cool thing. We do have some requirements. This is a new feature in SQL Server 2008. Uh, it's available in standard enterprise or developer edition. Now, that means that we have to have it on one of those editions. So when we enable policy-based management, it has to be on standard enterprise or developer. Okay. However, we can still evaluate the policies we create on that management server against SQL 2000 and 2005 instances. Okay. So we can still enforce those standards across those other versions. We just can't create the PBM server itself on anything other than 2008 standard enterprise or developer. Uh, just we like with CMS, everything is uh, stored in MSDB. So we've talked twice now about CMS has been in MSDB and policy-based management is in MSDB. So I hope there's some lights going off in some heads here going, hey, if everything's being stored in MSDB, I should probably be doing what to MSDB? Backing it up. Because if you don't back it up and you lose MSDB, guess what you lose? All that time and work and effort that you created all of these policies for, and you have tons of them, you will lose them all. Please make sure if you're going to use policy-based management that you are backing up MSDB. So here's some of the terms we use. The first one is facet. This one means that they're, they're, Microsoft has broken up the rules that we have into certain, um, I want to use categories, but certain aspects of SQL Server. Uh, the way that they've kind of separated the functions. I'll show you some of the facets and they'll make sense when I, when I show them to you. A condition. Conditions can define several things. And they're usually what we're looking for. They're kind of our filter or our where clause. And that condition can define um, the actual, so when we look down here, so you see target is down here, server restriction, so it can define what we're targeting. So maybe we're targeting um, these 10 servers. Uh, maybe we want a server restriction, so we can use a condition, a, a condition to say, hey, I only want this to affect developer edition, or SQL Server 2012, or 2000, or 2005. That way we can kind of get a little more granular and say, look, now this policy only works for this. So we can do that. So that's really uh, a handy way to be able to break these things down. The policy itself contains all of these other things. And you'll see that when, I, when we get into the demo that the policy contains what facet we're using, what condition we're using, what we're looking for to evaluate, uh, what servers we're trying to target, whether we want to restrict it to a certain servers in a particular area. We can also use categories. The cool thing about categories is, is I can do um, I can do things like, let's say I get audited for SOX uh, compliancy or CPI, uh, those types of things. I can have a bunch of policies that ensure, help me ensure that I'm compliant for those things, and I can create a category called SOX or CPI. I put them all in that group, in that category, and then instantly I'm good to go. As soon as I apply this, then I know that they will all be compliant. When we create policies, there's two different ways that we can create them. We can do it through the GUI and we can use it, do it through T-SQL. When we do it through the GUI, we've got a few steps we go through. And the first one is we want to create the check condition, and that's what we're looking for. What are we trying to check? What are we looking for to make sure it's set the way that we want it set? Um, after the condition is created, then we actually create the policy. The policy allows me to, um, well, the first thing you do is you tell it what the check condition is that you did in your previous step. Then you'll define the target evaluation mode. We haven't talked about that yet, but we will here in a little bit. And if there's any server restrictions, uh, conditions that we want to put on it. And then T-SQL. Um, don't rush to write these down. You guys can have access to my slide deck. Uh, if you go to ryanjadams.com on my blog and you click on presentations, you can actually download the slide deck there. Um, and I'll be happy to provide them to Mark and Steve to put on the, uh, the fundamentals chapter as well uh, after the presentation. But these... Uh, these system store procedures under T-SQL that you can use to create policies, those are actually undocumented. Generally what I like to say, everybody always tells you don't use the GUI. Never ever use the GUI. 
The real reason people tell you not to use the GUI is because there are certain things that the GUI hides from you. I can tell you that with policy-based management, there is nothing that these stored procedures or creating through T-SQL, there's nothing that the GUI is hiding from you. Uh, this is the one, probably one of the very few times I will tell you, use the GUI. If you want to be able to script them out, that way you can create the policies on 1520 servers, create it through the GUI, export it, and then import it to the other boxes. Okay. Um, and when you get to the very end of a policy, just like anything else, you can actually script it out. Okay. That's a much better way to go. Don't waste your time learning all this stuff right now. Of course, um, with exporting, we can import those. We can import those because policy-based management was really originally kind of designed to create rules for that server. So if I'm on demo one server, I'm creating rules for just that server. Okay, well that's fine and great, but what if I have 20, 50, 100 servers in my environment? But we can export those policies and re-import those. So I can export them from demo one and then I can import them on demo one, insta one. That way those policies will apply there as well. We can also import Microsoft best practice policies. Um, it will open to this folder by default. You don't actually have to write that down. Um, and I will show you that here in a second as well. When we do an import, we have a few options available to us. One is to replace duplicates with items that are imported. So if we have a policy and we suspect that, you know what, um, I created this six months ago. I exported it so that I have a backup copy of it. Um, and of course, I'm still backing up MSDB as well. But I suspect a junior DBA may have made some changes to this guy. And I'm not really sure. So you know what? I can import this and it will overwrite it. Okay, that's fantastic. A couple things happen. Um, the first is, is uh, that policy state there. You have three options you'll see there at the bottom. Preserve state, enabled or disabled. And this means that if the policy, when you first exported it six months ago, if it was an enabled state, um, then that's how it's going to come in. If I, select, if I select preserve state, however it was when it got exported is how it's going to come in. If it was enabled at that time, it's going to come in enabled. If it was disabled, it's going to come in disabled. Or I can select enabled or disabled and overwrite that. So I don't really care could have been what it was exported, what you know, whether it was in an enabled or disabled state. I want this to come in enabled. Now you'll notice that I put asterisks around disabled, and I did that for a reason. I want you guys, every time you import a policy, even if it's from Microsoft and trusted, to always import it in a disabled state. I want you to do that because I want you to bring it in disabled look at the policy to make sure that it really does what you want it to do. If it does and everything looks good to you, then you can enable it. It's just a right click to, re to enable it. There's no reason to not just bring it in in a disabled state. The last thing you want to do is bring something in that's going to break stuff because you didn't double check it to make sure that all the settings really and truly did what you wanted it to do. Now here's those evaluation modes. I said when we created a policy, we have to set the eval mode. Okay, we have four of them. The last two we technically, I'm going to kind of lump together just because of how they work. But the first one's on demand. And on demand means that I'm, I am doing it manually. I'm actually going to right click on this policy and I'm going to tell you to go evaluate it against this server. The second one is on schedule. So I can schedule this stuff to run automatically with SQL Agent so that I don't have to do it manually. I can tell it to run once a week once a day, once every hour, once a month, however I need that, I often need that to be evaluated. And then on change log only and on change prevent are very interesting ones. Um, what that means is that it detects the change, so it's something that raises a DDL event that can be traced with a DDL event. Either I log it, which means exactly what it sounds like, I just log the fact that it happened. It may have violated the policy, I still allowed that to occur, um, even though it violated it, and then I'm making a note of it. I'm logging it. On change per event, however, will actually stop it from happening. So not only did I catch the event when it occurred, but as opposed to letting it happen and just logging it, I actually stopped it from happening. Now I can tell you what happens in the background is it 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 sounds prevent like it really and truly stopped it from happening at all, but that's not entirely true. What it really does is it puts it inside of a trigger. 
uh, that way it can put it inside of a transaction. So it actually allows it to happen and then rolls it back if the violation occurs. So if it's something that's going to make a large change to your system or large amount of data changes to your system, be aware that it's going to let it happen and it's going to roll it back. So make note of that. So we have some methods of how we can evaluate these. Um, I'm going to show you how in the demo that we can do these. Um, they are what they sound like. So I can evaluate a single policy against uh, a single instance of SQL Server. I can evaluate more than one policy at a time. I can, if I got 10 policies, I can evaluate all of them against a single box. And of course, I can evaluate single and multiple policies against multiple instances as well. And that's where the CMS comes in handy. So we'll jump into a, uh, a demo here. This guy is very excited. He's probably more excited about the takeoff than the landing, I suspect. So before you get into the demo, do you mind if we answer a few questions? Sure. So um, is this the same as uh, multi-server administration, which seems to require encryption? You know what? I'm not sure that I follow that question. You might need some, uh, whoever asked that might have to do a little more clarification on that one. All right. Um, would you talk about how to make the CMS migration when a registered database server is moved to a new machine? Um, so we're not really dealing, if I understand the question correctly, we're not really dealing with the databases so much as we are just connections. With the CMS, we're just talking about connections to servers. We're not really dealing at the database level. Gotcha. That should be it for now. Let's we can go ahead to the demo. Okay. All right. So with policy-based management, we're going to use um, close out our CMS stuff here. I'll switch over here. So we're going to use our local default instance of demo one. And I'm going to run through this stuff a little quickly due to time, but here's what I want to take a look at. So here, if we go under management is where we're going to find policy management. It's this first guy right here. And you can see there's a red down arrow next to that. All we have to do is right click and enable it. It's as simple as that. Turns it on, everything's good to go. Now at this point everything's going to be blank. There's not going to be any conditions. There's not going to be any policies. We're starting fresh. Um, if I go to facets, I'm going to do, let's do view object export details. This kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of how Microsoft has grouped these things. So I can see that I've got stuff that is specific to an availability database. It's an availability group or specific settings to availability groups. Stuff that's specific to a database. Something I would find in database options. So we can kind of see how we've done this. Um, if we scroll further down, we'll see things like stored procedure. This is stuff that would apply to, to a stored procedure, or maybe things to a table or a trigger. So we can kind of see how these settings have been divided up and categorized for us. Now, I'm gonna, the one we're going to deal with most here is the database one. So to give you an idea of what a facet is, is these are all the settings that are contained in the database facet. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of, there's a decent scroll bar going on over here. So there's, there's quite a few settings in here. So we can do stuff with the name of a, of a database. Remember, this is all it's kind of scoped to a database. The owner of a database. What's the recovery model of a database? What's its current status? It's a version, is trustworthy turned on. So we've got a lot of different options available to us. So let's go in and um, let's say that we want to make sure that auto create statistics is enabled on all of our servers. So let's go ahead and look at a policy for that. So we'll right click, I'm going to do new policy. And we'll give it a name. We'll just call it uh, Auto stats. And the first thing we have to do is this check condition. So we have to create a check condition first. So we can just click new condition here. If we had some already defined, we could pick and choose from those. 
ahead and create a new one. I'm going to call it Auto Create Stats. And the facet I want to use here is going to be the database facet. And then the fields are all those things when I opened up the database facet. These are all the fields that we're going to see here. So I'm going to look for Auto Create Statistics. And it's actually called Auto Create Statistics Enabled. And I want Auto Create Statistics Enabled to be true. So my operator, I can do equals or not equals. Depending upon what fields you pick, certain fields may have different operators available to you. And I'll show you a different one in a minute. I want Auto Create Statistics to be true. I want it to be on. I'm going to click OK here. Okay, against targets, it says every database. Okay, we're going to run against every database. That's great. Uh, these are the eval modes. Now you're going to notice that on demand and on schedule are the only two available. You don't see on change log only and on change prevent here. The reason for that is because every single setting inside of one of those facets has to raise a DDL event in order for on change log only or on change prevent to be available for you. You may run across instances, I know that I have, where you go, um, yeah, I found this setting inside of this facet, and it does indeed raise a DDL event. I can trace it, and I can prove it. But for some reason, on change, log only and prevent are not available to me. And the reason is because if there's 50 settings in a facet, if even one of those does not raise a DDL event, then you won't be able to use on change, log only, or prevent for anything inside that facet. Now the good news is, is some settings are available in multiple facets, so although you might not be able to do it, what you want to do with an on change prevent in this particular facet, you might be able to find that setting in a different facet. Okay, so sometimes you kind of got to hunt and peck and look around a little bit. We'll use on demand, that's our manual mode. We'll go ahead and click OK. We'll notice it created the condition over here under conditions, and it created our policy for us. So let's go ahead and evaluate it and see what that looks like. All I got to do is right click and do evaluate. And this will immediately run this and evaluate it against every database right here on my local demo one insta one or demo one default instance here. Okay. I'm going to expand this target column so we can see what's in here. Okay, and we can see everything that's in here. And we'll notice that um, you know, I've got, what, three, four, seven databases here, and two of them failed. So database PBM1 and PBM2 both failed. If I click View here in the details, it'll open up this other window, and I can see that the field it was looking for was Auto Create Statistics Enabled. It expected it to be true. I wanted it to be true but it turned out to be false. So that means Auto Create Statistics Enabled is actually turned off on that database. Now the cool thing is, is if I were to click this for PBM1, I'm only going to check that one, and I were to click the Apply button down here at the bottom, it says Applying the Policy modifies the selected targets that don't comply. Are you sure you want to apply the policy? I'm going to say yes. Two things happened here. First is it changed the setting. And second is it reevaluated the policy just to make sure that the setting really and truly did get changed. And I can see the PBM1, and I can click the view on details, expect it to be true, and now the actual value is true. If I were to go look at that database, I will actually see that Auto Create Statistics Enabled has now been turned on. So that's pretty sweet. I could have checked this checkbox up here at the top, too, and it would have checked everything off. I could have changed all of them that violated this policy instantly. I'm not going to change uh, PBM2 because I want, I want you to, uh, to be able to see that one again later. So that's a pretty cool thing. Now, if I were standing in front of you in person, at this point I would ask you, and I want you to think about this, looking at all the database names that you see here, I'll give you a second to think about this. What's missing? I see you know, there's an IDBA, an MDW, PBM1 and 2, reporting services, got a couple here, there's a Ryan test database. But there's a couple databases that are missing, isn't there? Which ones are those? It's the system databases, isn't it? Master, Model, MSDB, TempDB, all, none of those guys are there. But that's kind of weird because when I created this policy, I could have sworn that I told this thing to evaluate it against every database. Let's go take a look at this guy again. 
sure enough, there it is, every database. Now, I can click that guy. You can kind of see me clicking it, right? I can click that thing until I'm blue in the face, just as blue as it is, and it's not going to do anything. That is a default built-in target. Anytime you click something in PBM like this and it doesn't open and you can't look at it, that means it was built in by the default, it was a default built in one by the system. And what I'm going to tell you about that is anytime you see a default one built in by the system like this, you need to be suspicious. You need to be suspicious that the name that they called it that does what it really thinks it does. It that didn't run against every database, did it? It didn't. So what I can do is I click the down over here and I can create a new condition. Let's call this uh, user and let's call it uh, user and system DBs. And we're going to use the database facet again. And this condition is going to say um, I'm looking for one called is system object in here. There it is. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add this twice. What I want you to see out of this is that I'm building an expression here. So I can say I want the database to be is system object true. I also want to include it, I can say or if it's false, I want to include it as well. So I've created a new condition for that. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. I click evaluate the policy. If I expand this guy out, there we go. There's tempdb, there's msdb, there's master and model. So be aware of that, that uh, possibility. Now I also told you um, if I right click policies and I go to import policy, I told you we could import some best practice policies from Microsoft. If I click the ellipsis, here it will automatically take me to the folder. Actually what it does is it takes you, it will automatically take you to this folder, the policies folder, and you can see that we have policies for analysis services, some for the database engine, and some for reporting services. We're going to go into the database engine, follow that all the way through, and you can see we've got a handful of policies that Microsoft has given us. This is a great, great place to start with policy-based management because I can look at my, what Microsoft has done as some good examples and then get an idea of the different things that I can and can't do. So it's a great place to start. Let's look at the auto shrink one. Okay, replace items with uh, replace duplicates with items that are imported. Remember, I told you let's always select disabled until we make sure it does what we want it to do, and we'll go and click OK. Now you'll notice that it did create the database auto shrink over here policy, but it actually created. Uh, let's see three conditions, auto shrink disabled condition, an enterprise or standard edition, and an online user database condition. So we can have more than one condition to define certain things in our policy. So you can see it actually brought three of those in. Let's see what this guy looks like. Uh, let's see, here's a, let's click the ellipsis for the check condition. So here's what we're looking for. It's using the database performance facet. It's looking for auto shrink field to be false. I want it to be turned off. Okay, looks good. Uh, there's one for online user databases. Now when I click this one, it actually opens it up. So this wasn't default built in by the system. It came from Microsoft, but it wasn't built into the system. It wasn't with SQL Server installed. We actually had to import this. So we can look at this one. So what we're familiar with the is system object is false. Okay, so that means it's excluding master model MSDB. So it's, it's focusing on a user database, not a system and the status has to be normal. Okay, so we can't be in the middle of recovery, in the middle of a restore, those types of things. It has to be a regular normal status. Okay. Um, I'm going to change this. Now the demand it's on demand. I'm going to go ahead and change it to on schedule. What I want you to notice is this enable checkbox up here, it's grayed out. Okay. As soon as I change it from on demand to on schedule, now I can check that box, okay? And I have to check that box. If I don't, it won't actually run. I'll check off enabled. I need to pick a schedule because I told schedule. 
we're going to end up running it manually anyway, so I'm just going to pick one at random. Here's one's called weekly at 7 p.m. That's fine. You notice there's a server restriction down here called Enterprise or Standard Edition. Wonderful. Click OK. Then what I'm going to do is if I go down here, now these are the jobs that I have. You'll notice I've got three jobs. Okay. One called DBA Metadata CPU Utilization, Execute EPM, and Assist Policy Purge History. Assist Policy Purge History, by the way, is a default built-in system. You guys may have noticed even if you're not using PBM, it's already there. And what that does is it purges every time we evaluate history or evaluate policies in our environment, we keep a history of that. And what that does is it cleans out that history. If I refresh the jobs, though, Here's that new job it created. Wow, that is a beautiful looking job right there, isn't it? Look at that, just that's a sweet GUID. That's just awesome. So my suggestion here is anytime you create a scheduled policy, go down to the job and rename it. Otherwise, one of these days you're going to be looking at jobs, trying to figure out what does what, and you will have absolutely no clue what this does when you have 500 of them in here. So do this every time you create a new policy. Go change that. I'm going to start the job. I'm going to kick it off. Now when this guy comes back with success, and he will, all it means is that he ran the job successfully. He doesn't have anything to do with uh, uh, violations of the policy. Okay. I just want to let you know we're at the top of the hour. Yeah, so we're going to go touch over, guys, if you'll bear with me, because I want to make sure that you see the rest of, uh, rest of this. And we're almost done. I'll wrap it up pretty quick here. So it ran. Um, we'll look at the database auto shrink here. And we'll do view history. So as we can see, indeed, we did have some errors here. Um, if I click the details, it'll give me the exact same thing as we did before. I expect it to be false, and it was true. If I want to know which database it was on, though, I have to go down here to the bottom and I have to kind of scroll through here and I can see that it was actually PBM1 so I kind of got to look through this this XML to figure out what it looks like. So unfortunately that part's not pretty hunted down when it runs on schedule. Um, but that's how we can kind of see what happens when we do it on schedule. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in the interest of time because clearly went way slower than I planned on. I told you that when that happened and we ran that on schedule, that's fine and great, but it, nothing popped up and told me that I had a violation. So if, if I, you can download my slide deck, it's got these in here. You'll notice I have four alerts here. If you create these four alerts, you will be notified of any and every violation that you have for your policies. All you have to do is create these four alerts. It's that simple. Okay, I'll show you the. This one's for log only events, um, and we're just looking for error numbers here. Against all databases, very simple to set up. I've got it in my slide deck when we flip back over, um, so you guys can download that and set all of those up if you want. Um, so we didn't get quite as in depth as what I really wanted to get into. Uh, unfortunately, we ran out of uh, ran out of time. Um, I do want to show you this, um, the Enterprise Policy Management Framework. Uh, I'll explain a little more when we get to the slide deck here. I just wanted to show you what it looked like. But this is a report. I like to see a report of, hey, look, I've got two that are out of compliance. So um, this is something that's open source that you can download and you can install this. It comes with the database that you need. It comes with the, the, all the scripts. It comes with everything that you need. And you can get nice, pretty reports on all of your violations. Management loves to see that stuff, right? So let me flip back over here to the slide deck real quick, and we'll finish up super fast. Okay, so I already showed you the alerts. Obviously, there's some requirements for alerts. You want your database mail operator to be set up so you can get, actually get emailed about those. You can download my slide deck. You only need these four. These are the error numbers. You can download that off ryanjadams.com. Uh, click the presentations up at the top, and I'll provide that to Mark as well. Um, if you go out to codeplex.com is where you can download the Enterprise Policy Management Framework, which is the report that I showed you. It gives you everything that you need. Okay? It, it gives you the script to create the database. It gives you the PowerShell script for uh, the job to run to evaluate all of your policies against your CMS, um, which is one thing I didn't actually get to. 
um, and uh, it'll give you the actual reports too. And there's only a couple things that document it pretty well, so that's kind of a cool thing uh, for you guys to be able to use. It's free and open source there on CodePlex. I uh, won't jump into the demo. A bunch of use cases I have out here just to give you an idea of the things that you can evaluate. Uh, recovery models, the database mail enabled, those kinds of things. There's a lot of things that we can make sure our settings are standard in our enterprise. Um, so summary, obviously we know that we talked about CMS, we talked about policy-based management, how to create them, different ways to evaluate those, um, setting up those four alerts, and then uh, just some resources for you to go out and check that reporting thing out if you want to if you want to be able to play around with that. You can pull down the slide deck. Here's a bunch of resources for you. Um, there's a book. Um, all three of these guys wrote this book. They're all online. They're all on Twitter. They all blog, so you can check all that out. Uh, good book here for policy-based management. Um, and so that is pretty much all I've got for now. No, that was awesome. Ryan, man, I really appreciate uh, you giving the presentation today. You've obviously, uh, you're obviously well versed in public speaking because it was easy to understand. It was straightforward. You talked slowly and clearly. Um, it, I mean, it was good information. It really was. Um, and I encourage everybody to uh, check out Ryan's blog at uh, ryanjadams.com uh, and uh, check him out on, on Twitter with uh, at ryanjadams. And uh, I mean, Ryan, you obviously know your stuff. Um, because of time, I think what we'll do though is I'll kind of bundle up the questions and get those to you, um, and you can take a look at those. And maybe, um, do you mind replying to to some of those? Yeah. So if you could just send me those uh, questions, what I'll do is I'll write a blog post and I'll answer them all in a blog post, and then I'll just give you the link for that. And we can shoot that out to everybody. Awesome. That works. So. Um, but uh, Ryan, again, I appreciate it. Uh, we did give out a $25 Amazon gift card, and that went to uh, Robert Delval, or Delval. I'm sorry, Robert, if I'm mutilating your uh, name. But uh, um, let's see. So I'll get those questions to you, and within a week, we'll have on our uh, link on our website, so the users can not only download. Uh, the recorded session, but get to any of the the other pertinent information, such as the slide deck, and and we'll have your contact information, Ryan, out there. Uh, again, I thank you very much. We really really appreciate it. That was that was awesome. Great, thank you. Appreciate that, guys. And yeah, uh, had a good time. Yeah, it was good. And I, I just want to thank everyone uh, for stopping in and checking out the presentation. And uh, everyone, take care. Have a great day. Great, thanks, everyone.